So I'm Robert Kading. I am new to Hawaii. I've been here since October 1st, still getting adjusted. What I wanted to talk about today is my own experience. Why did I choose to go into the field of floriculture? Um, I took a very strange route to get here, but once I made that decision, it sort of all made sense for me. But um, I want to talk a little bit about teachers or maybe that one person that influenced me and what it was that they said or what it was that they did that made me think that I could do it and that I would be happy doing that. But first of all, I have to say, of all the presentations I've given, this is probably the most difficult I've had to put together because you're teachers. And this is, this is very frightening, uh, can be. But also, I feel very lucky because as you grow up and you think about that one teacher, maybe you know, that I had in third grade, I can still remember her. I would love to say, you know what, you, did, you smiled at me one time when you knew I was having a hard time. And you smiled at me and you changed everything for me and to this day I remember that. So even though I can't say that to her, I can say that to all of you. I'm sure there are students that you've done something like that for and you've changed their day, their week, their month, and maybe even their lives. So thank you all for doing what you do. But uh, back in 2009, University of Florida, I was a student there. There was a study done, and it was a very interesting study because they wanted to look at why did students in the horticulture program choose specifically to go into floriculture or ornamental, ornamental production. So they went into the classrooms and they surveyed them, and some of the responses were funny. Some of them were made a lot of sense. Some of them. Uh, you know, couldn't quite make sense of, but ultimately what they said was there was someone when they were young that influenced them, or they had some experience when they were young that stuck with, that really stuck with them and influenced them to go into that field. So working uh, someone who maybe had a hobby and they would include them as a child, or someone like one of my experiences I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, or a relative or, or something like that where they really introduce them to the beauty of plants. Oh, everybody has to eat vegetables or you know, agricultural products, but sometimes as a kid you don't think about some of the other, other agricultural commodities. But I thought that was very interesting. And where I come from is actually southern Indiana. And I don't know, has anyone been to Southern Indiana? Really? No, it's about the University. Really? Wow, I was expecting people to say Indiana. Well, what? Down really? Yeah. Well, that's amazing. You know, I used to work at some of the caves down there and do those tours. Yeah, when I was in high school. Maybe. <laughs> okay, Indiana. This is pretty much what it looked like there. Rolling hills, green. The county I lived in had about 3,000 people in it. It was very rural, isolated. There weren't a lot of opportunities. There weren't a lot of opportunities if you were different. And by different, I mean maybe, especially at the time, where now you can, teachers are really good at recognizing that maybe that student needs to learn in a different way. Back then, it wasn't that way. You either did it this way or you, you flunked. So it was difficult for me because I had a different way of learning. I was very visual and I wanted to do hands-on things, but I didn't even realize that until I was in college. So it was a real struggle for me. So here it is, Indiana, there on the right. I haven't been back for years. There was my county, Crawford County, right next to Kentucky. But when I was about six years old, we had, in the small town I lived in, we had some, an older couple down the street and every evening they would go for a walk. And they came by the house one day and asked me specifically, now I don't know why, I had brothers and sisters, would he want to go with us on a walk? So my, I was with my grandmother at the time and she said yes. So every day at, I don't know, six o'clock they would stop and get me and take me with them for a walk. So we would walk through the forest along the river and they would explain to me plants, what they were, uh, answer my questions about well, what is this and what is that? And that was a very important experience for me, just that exposure every day to the natural world, which really I didn't get. Other than this, as a kid, that was pretty much it. But um, then when I was in fifth grade, we moved. This was 
remarkable and you have to think about because are any are any of you from the mainland that lived on the mainland for years and okay so you can probably relate to this so fifth grade we moved we moved to another town because the town we lived in was completely wiped out by a flood so we we were kind of homeless for a little while and finally found this house huge big yard but it was kind of winter time in the spring all this stuff started to come up out of the ground and one of them was peonies so it turned out the woman who owned this house collected hundreds and hundreds of varieties of peonies irises daylilies and it was just an absolute to this day it gives me chills thinking the first time i saw these peonies and smelled what a peony smelled like but anyway so this is this is what it looked like and she also had the irises, and I had never really seen an iris before, didn't think about it, but I was just enthralled by the color, the shape, they looked so weird. Um, and here they all came up like magic, you know, that, that year. But of course, I'm not the only one who was enthralled by irises. You know, Van Gogh was very influenced by flowers, and I can really relate um, to paintings like this. Just really captures the beauty. So, High school really for me was where the trouble started. It was a very small high school. It was one high school for the whole county. Everybody went there, everybody knew each other. And I was really struggling, um, struggling in high school to do some of the work. And I, I didn't really know why. I just knew that I had trouble. And then I had a teacher, I guess this was actually seventh grade, who said, I know that you're struggling. Why don't you do something else? Why don't you come up with a project, a science project that you can then design and test. Now, no one had ever said this, this kind of thing to me before. Like, you can do something different. You can be creative. And so I was like, wow, really? Wow, what, what would I do? So it wasn't really plant related because I was fascinated with lizards. So I actually designed this experiment with these animals, which you have everywhere here. But for me, you know, I had to get them in the mail, and they came in a little box, and uh, what, what effect temperature had on their coloration. Like if the temperature cold, would they change, warm, it would change, you know, and so forth. And that was really great. I learned a lot from designing that, presenting that, writing that up. And that's when I thought, wow, this is, this is really cool, this, this science thing. You can be creative. But I got sidetracked, and I got sidetracked by piano. So I decided to um, go to this concert and I heard someone play on the piano a Beethoven piece and I said I want to learn how to play that. So I immediately started taking lessons and it turned out I had some ability, really got into piano, worked at it, you know, eight to ten hours a day practicing and absolutely loved it. I was on track to be a concert pianist. That was my goal. So uh, after high school, I had a music scholarship to Indiana University, one of the regional campuses first, and then went up to the main campus. And the main campus, I don't know if any of you know about the music school, the main campus, but considered one of the best in the world. And of course, I was thinking I was one of the best in the world because I got into IU. Well, when I went to IU and I saw what real talent was, I said, there is no way I can compete with these people. I was, I was okay, but I was never gonna compete with these people. So it was an eye-opening experience for me. Um, so what the question was, what was I gonna do? I needed this creative outlet. I needed to do something. So, questioning that, decided to study Near Eastern languages. Yes, I know, it sounds so strange. But Near Eastern languages, mainly the ancient languages, uh, you know, classical Arabic, uh, classical Hebrew, Persian, Akkadian, Syriac, all these languages, and I absolutely loved it because of the interpretation aspect and consulting multiple sources to try to come to some understanding of what it means. There was a lot of creativity in there that um, you would probably be surprised. But I also, at the same time, did a plant science, did, did a degree in plant science. So I was also studying plants. 
um, mainly orchids. They really got into orchids. And um, after graduation, I was thinking I was going to go to grad school for Semitic studies, language studies. Applied to all the schools, got into all the schools. All the schools said the same thing. This is not a good time to be studying the humanities in an advanced degree. We want you to come here, but we cannot fund you. Every school said the same thing. So I thought, OK, what should I do now? Um, I took a little bit of time off, thought about it, did some work, reflected. And I thought, you know, there is a lot of creativity in plants. There's a lot of creativity. There's a lot of problem solving. Um, Let's explore that a little bit more. So after, after you know, I'd finished my bachelor's, I did a little bit more work, coursework, got some good teachers, got some good advice, and said, yes, this is the field for me. Uh, I went to University of Florida, did a master's in entomology and a PhD in plant pathology from the problem solving perspective. I didn't necessarily want to spend all my time in a lab. I think labs are extremely important. But for me, it was the really getting out there and working with the growers. So at this time, I had an experience where there was a, there was a grower in central Florida that was basically losing their business. They had a bacterial disease, and it was coming through so quickly, they were losing plants daily, you know, 20, 30, 40 plants a day. It was so fast. They had called the university. They couldn't help them. They had no one to refer them to. Someone called me and said, why don't you go, just go and see what's going on there. So I went there, saw what was going on, realized that I could probably help them through this, through this problem. So I went back to my advisors, you know, still a student, can't just do whatever you want, presented what was going on, and I said, you know, I think I can, I think I can help them. And they said, okay, go do it. So I worked with them for about three years pulled them back from the brink of closing. They were ready to bulldoze the place. Um, we kept at it, made it through. And one day, he called me, the owner called me, and you know, gave me an update and said, you know, it's because of you, I'm going to be able to send my kids to college. And it was at that moment I said, yes, this is, this is it, because not only do you have to really think outside of the box to solve these kind of problems, because you're going to encounter problems no one has seen before. Not many people have had to deal with a grower who's been covered with lava. I mean, everything is a challenge, and everything here is even more of a challenge. But thinking outside the box, coming up with creative solutions to, to problems, um, really requires that creative mind. And you know, some of you probably know Temple Grandin. I, I heard her speak a few years ago, and she said something to me. It was very important. She said, you know, it takes all kinds of minds to solve problems, not just a certain way of thinking. So if you can get this type of person looking at a problem, and then this type of person looking at a problem, you're more likely to come to solutions. And she also said, you know, it's very important to recognize that not all kids can operate in the same way. And if you can recognize that and sort of help those individuals along, it can really make a difference. Maybe not all kids are going to go to college. Or maybe they'll only do a two-year degree. But the great thing about horticulture and floriculture is there are jobs available and highly needed for people of all skill and all educational levels. So even a student who maybe can't go and do an advanced degree could still have a very rewarding, long career in horticulture, or specifically floriculture, because that's my area, um, in that field. So there may be some we want to encourage to, hey, why don't you try, do a two-year degree, see how that goes for you. If, that, if you're able to get through that, but you feel that's enough, then let's try to get you into an internship program, or let's try to find you something that you would be fulfilled doing without doing an advanced degree. So Florida was great. I mean, after that experience, working with this grower and getting out there and working with growers every day and solving problems and realizing the amount of creativity I could still do really made me very happy. Chose what I wanted to do, chose what area I wanted to go into specifically, 
But I ended up with a postdoc at the USDA in Beltsville, Maryland, which I didn't really like that much because it was so lab oriented. After three years, I found this great job at Oregon State University in Eastern Oregon running the diagnostic lab for all the growers in the three state area. So mainly Oregon, Washington State, Idaho. Um, growers coming in, bringing you their plants with problems, me diagnosing that and consulting with them on how to fix them. So it was, it was a lot of fun. But what I really liked about it here was I was able to start a program to work with the high school to bring in high school students to work half a day for credit every day. So I started with one, got two, and had and eventually had several, but going around to the schools with roaches was just a blast. I mean, here, I mean, getting to work with these kids and, and see their faces light up when you present them with this terrible, ugly thing that they initially thought was terrible, but then they liked it. It was so much fun doing that. But I had these two students that uh, were remarkable. First, I had Bryce. He's on the right. He came to the lab when he was 15, and um, he was really a non-traditional learner. He, he, uh, he needed a different way of learning, kind of like I did, and because I'd had that experience, I could recognize that and wanted to continue to do that with other students, give them opportunities. So that was Bryce, and then I had Lily. She's on the left. She's currently in Russia. She's been over there for a year doing an uh, exchange program. But she started coming to the lab when she was 10 years old with her mother, who was a consultant. So every now and then her mother would bring her in, and I would always talk to her, take her, show her the lab, let her know what was going on, and you could just see that spark. You know how it is, I'm sure you've all seen it. You get that kid, you have a subject or something, and you get that spark, and you're like, wow, I really want to cultivate that. So she came in once, and I had this big cage of praying mantises. Now these were not, these were not um, for biocontrol. These were sort of a hobby. I raised praying mantises. She was just so fascinated by this that I said, well, why don't you see, you know, let's talk to your mom and see if you can set up a cage and, and you can try. She was so excited. So she came in with her mom and we got her set up. We got these praying mantises, took them home. And every few months, you know, she would report to me. She was getting mating. She had eggs. She was just, she had a great time. But I always promised her, when you get 15, come back and I'll give you a job. And she did. 15, her 15th birthday, she called and said, okay, I'm ready. So she came in, worked for me for two summers, got extremely skilled. You know, both of these, both of these students, I could, I could give them a fungus from a plate and say, I need you to do DNA extraction, design some primers, do PCR, and I want you to tell me what, what species that is based on its DNA. A few days later, they'd have it done. They were really skilled. They were great. So there's a picture of the praying mantises that we, we had. It's called the ghost mantis. So they were tiny, but they were really cool. And you could see how a kid could think that was neat. I, I would think. I mean, me as a kid, I just love this kind of stuff, but they were so weird. Some of them would be green, some of them would be brown, but she just was enthralled by these. Bryce, um, I gave him a project, and he actually did really better than I thought. Um, he found this fungus, the one on um, this dish here on the left, the one over there that's dark, which works as a biological control for the other fungus. So this fungus here on the left is a pathogen, and the one on the right is not. And so this is something he went out and actually found himself, brought it into the lab, uh, designed his own experiments. I told him, go design your experiments, how you're going to do it, how you're going to test it, how you're going to measure it, and then bring it back to me and propose to me what you want to do. And it's amazing what a kid can do when you give them that sort of freedom to design something. Because they're thinking about it in a very creative way. So he brought this uh, great work. He actually presented this at the uh, annual national meeting of the Plant Pathologist Society as a high school student. It was the first time they had had one. So um, yeah, it was just so great. I loved working with these kids and continued to work with them uh, up until the time I left and came to Hawaii. So because of that 
background I had in flowers and floriculture, I wanted to get back into that field. But the problem is there aren't a lot of jobs that are specifically floriculture. You have to either be in Florida or you have to be in Hawaii. So I was always looking, always looking and waiting and watching. Finally, you know, finally the job came open, applied for it, got the job, came here in October. And yeah, there we are. That's where we are today. I am located on the Big Island, service most of the, the Big Island. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I have a lot of new growers that are just starting operations. Right now I'm working with about five. We're going through the whole procedure, selecting land, deciding what you want to grow, how are you going to grow it, getting testing, building structures. Um, so we have a few. We have about, f about five that will be, hopefully this coming year, will go into production. New things are things that aren't grown a lot. They're choosing to do things that aren't already grown, like um, there's not a lot of calla lilies being grown over there. A few other things because um, they want to do something different. So it's been a lot of fun working with the growers. The beginning, once I got here, I sent out the survey. And one of the questions I asked was, what is your biggest concern for the industry, floriculture specifically, or, or ornamentals? And I've had about 41 respondents so far, and about 67% have all said the same thing, which is, we're worried there aren't going to be any other growers to take over. So now the question is, how do you get young people interested? How do you get young people thinking that it's a good job? So that's where we are, and that's why we're here talking to all of you. Hopefully, through some of these programs that are being developed and are being started, we will see some of those younger students that we may be able to give those opportunities to that they then decide to stay in Hawaii and run an operation. Hopefully, getting them exposed, just like me and just like Tessie and everyone else, at some point when they were young, had an exposure, had an influence to really inspire them to go into that field. And hopefully, we will do the same for the next generation of growers through programs like this. One of the things we'd like to do is develop some sort of an internship program where we can get some older students or even early college matched up with growers and even maybe do a rotation where they can go through different operations, different type of operations, different plants, let them see what it's like on a day-to-day -day basis. Because what's going to happen is it is hard work. You all know that. But you're going to get that one kid that says, I don't care how hard the work is. This is where I belong. And those are the ones that we then want to find. These are still in the very early stages. Um, the internship program that I had at Oregon S State for high school, um, I really enjoyed it. It worked very well. All of those kids currently are pursuing, pursuing some sort of horticulture or horticulture-related field. So Bryce is currently at OSU as a junior. Lily will be back. Um, I was able to hook her up with another internship at another horticulture lab since I was gone where she will go there and work, get a chance to work with an up-and-coming female scientist, which I think would be great for her for that influence. So, um, yeah, just keeping that sort of program going, I hope. You know, remember, it's still new here, still early, but that's where I would, I would like to go with that. Maybe not so much programs like this. I just happened to see this and thought it was really funny because... <sighs> You know, wanting to inspire a student to really do something strange, but when do you cross the line? This is probably it. Okay, thank you.